Our guest today is Kavi Chong Kitavorn, who joins us from Bangkok, Thailand. Kavi is a veteran columnist on Southeast Asian affairs for the Bangkok Post and other publications. He is also senior fellow at Chulalongkorn University. He is a longtime analyst of the political, security, and economic happenings of Southeast Asia, and his commentary is sought out by many. Over his career, Kavi has served as bureau chief in Dom Penh, Cambodia from 1988 to 1990, and as bureau chief in Hanoi, Vietnam from 1990 to 1992. From 1993 to 1994, he served as special assistant to the secretary general at the headquarters of ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, before later returning to journalism. In 1993, Kavi was a Reuters fellow at Oxford University. And in 2001, he was a Neiman Fellow at Harvard University. And from 1999 to 2003, he was the president of the Thai Journalists Association. Kavi is a prolific writer with numerous articles. I suggest checking his frequent pieces on the Bangkok Post website to learn about the latest in Southeast Asia. Kavi, we're just thrilled to have you. How are you? Thank you. Thank you, I'm fine. Bangkok is a little bit hot. <laughs> well, excellent. To begin, you wrote an insightful piece on March 15 addressing how Thai society is split over the Ukraine-Russia war. You mentioned that Thais have three different outlooks on the crisis. Can you review for us what these three divides are and are the divisions associated with specific groups in Thai society? Well, it's a very good question. It's actually, it would take three days to answer. Each day would take uh, uh, for one's uh, opinion. Thailand has three different uh, views on this situation. One is a very conservative based on traditional and uh, long-standing Thai former Russian empire relation which have impact on the current. The second one is another end of the pendulum uh, is the younger generation uh, with a modern outlook for democratic developments. And the last group is someone who are in between, who have to uh, devise our foreign policy, who have to put into practice. But, you know, one of the most interesting thing, uh, Professor Grover, is that Thailand is so free to discuss about this. Actually, within Southeast Asia, Thailand is the only country, I would say, that have raised the level of the Russian Ukraine war into our regional topic. So the first view was very conservative. A lot of people said it's very elite, try to justify Russia aggression by using historical ties. Because uh, in, 19, uh, in 1897, uh, as you know, at the time, Russian empire was under uh, Shah Nicholas II, which uh, has a very good uh, tie with uh, Rama V, the king of Thailand. So this is the incidents that all Thai historians cite that uh, the personal relation between Rama V, the Thai king at the time, and Shah has helped Thailand to escape Western colonization, which you have known, and other people know that in Southeast Asia, we are the only country that has remained independent. So that's a major factor. Russia relation with Thailand at this moment Trade relations uh, is very minute, you know, very small comparison to United States and also China and other countries. So that's the, the main one. The second one is for the younger generation, which uh, view the current um, conflicts uh, under the context of uh, the struggle between democracies and autocracy, you know. I think this theme is very popular among young uh, generation 
the Gen X, not only in Thailand, in Malaysia, in Indonesia, uh, in Taiwan, in Hong Kong, they all want to see the country uh, like Thailand uh, become fully a liberal democracy. But Thailand is struggling uh, with uh, this kind of uh, system since 1932. It's almost uh, 80 some years ago. And I would say we fail. You know, if you're a professor, Thailand uh, only obtain C plus for mm -hmm. democratization because it uh, could not uh, write good narrative mm -hmm. of what's going on in Thailand. It always gets stuck. You know, you know, you will give A plus for the country that are very focused on narrative, like Singapore. Mm -hmm. They can get A plus. Thailand narrative always the best is C plus. The worst is uh, D. Very bad. So that's the mid. Uh, that's the another extreme. But we are talking about in the middle that has Thailand survived all the uh, conundrums of the uh, disruptive world. That is the decision maker. Uh, you have Thai foreign uh, ministry and some concerns uh, security apparatus, or which made the decision. As you know, Thailand joined international community, 141 of them in voting in favor against uh, the aggression, Russian aggression in Ukraine. It was, uh, it was very good uh, position. I fully support, but it has, as I said, uh, create some uh, argument, counter argument, which I have outlined. And the argument continue for no reason. I, they just love to uh, to argue what should we do. They think that we should be sympathized with uh, Ukraine, you know. And Thailand, because of its position, just uh, two days ago, the Thai government have assisting uh, Russian Ukraine tourists get stuck in Phuket. You know, Phuket is a popular resort, and also Samui Island. They get stuck uh, about eight thousands of them, they cannot use their MasterCards and all that because of the sanctions and all that. So Thailand was not part of the uh, sanctioned country like Singapore. So I think uh, they find a way to help them by giving them temporary shelters, uh, help them provide uh, certain food and that kind of thing. So this is the overall uh, situation you know in response to your answer i hope i answer all your uh, questions very much so thank you on march 1 you wrote a column about how asean must adjust to new realities and altered relations between great powers as a result of russia's invasion of ukraine can you elaborate a bit on how you think asean will need to change and prepare itself in this new geopolitical environment? Thank you very much. Uh, there are two things that a lot of people didn't see. ASEAN now has more informal consultation at the leaders level because of Hun Sen. I know uh, Hun Sen has been demonized as the nominee of China because of 2012 incidents. But as you can see now, uh, Hun Sen behaved differently after the 17 February retreat among the foreign minister, all ASEAN support Hun Sen, support Cambodian chair, support special envoy Brak Sopon. Because ASEAN, when ASEAN reach a consensus, uh, ASEAN would not step back. ASEAN will continue until the end. Just look at the Cambodian conflict. We made decision and then 13 years later, it's slow though. Professor is slow. But it's for durable solution. In engaging with major power, I think uh, we need to make sure that uh, ASEAN will not choose side because both sides are not suitable for us. So we must choose ASEAN side always. And ASEAN has done so. So given all the crisis throughout its existence for, for 54 years, we have, as you can see, various uh, crisis and dynamic that 
show our weaknesses. But one thing that has not taken ASEAN is ASEAN uh, principle that contained in Bangkok Declaration and Treaty of Amity and Cooperation. Um, I was so surprised when people talk about ASEAN, they did not look at the uh, mechanism of ASEAN. But all the time, when you talk about NATO, they always Article 5, Article 5. ASEAN also have its own uh, a pillar. We have, what do you call, Treaty of Amity that uh, stress the non-interference, uh, consultation, non-use uh, of force, and also of consensus. These are the things that has made ASEAN uh, uh, the way it is. But of course, in front of major power, ASEAN is very weak. We cannot fight against anyone. We don't have any armed force. We are not military allies. We are there to promote economic cooperations, well-being of its uh, 657 uh, million people, much bigger than European Union. Uh, and uh, as you know, uh, ASEAN citizens, especially Philippines, uh, uh, have more children quickly. You see, we have problem in Thailand. You see, we are becoming gray uh, society. So I would like to see ASEAN uh, much more, what do you call, uh, engaged in consultation, like a country in Latin America, uh, like Mokasa, with they have principle of automaticity when you have a crisis leader get together. And I think Hun Sen now has done that. Listen, guys, let us talk. You know, I'm going to do this. You don't agree with me, fine, you know, but don't demonize me. I'm doing this for ASEAN. You know, after all, I remember on the 24th of April last year when ASEAN hold, uh, leader hold an emergency meeting, it was Hun Sen, the only leader who spoke out, look straight in the eyes uh, of uh, Minong Lai at, in Jakarta said, you know, let ASEAN help you. Look at me, ASEAN help me, even though I was not a member. And now look at how my country has come together. Of course, in the West, media, narrative, he is a dictator, but he's someone that has uh, strengthened economic growth, of course, is very imperfect. He has a lot of problem from it in, but now he wants to uh, do a better job because it will be his third time. He wants to leave a legacy for his son. He has anointed uh, his son, Hun uh, Manet, you know, as his successor. So you can describe it as the dynastic uh, political system or whatever, but, uh, Cambodia now is worried about uh, stability and economic growth, just like in Thailand, just like the rest of Southeast Asia. Last month, you wrote that there is a new pragmatism on the rise in ASEAN. You assert that despite internal differences over serious issues like the Myanmar coup and its associated insurgency, ASEAN still remains um, a close unit um, a pragmatic family by focusing on common areas of interest. And you list some of those common areas, security, strengthening regional integration, digital transformation, increasing competitiveness in public health, among others. Um, Kovi, um, what more can you tell us about ways in which ASEAN these days has demonstrated a new pragmatism? Well, they want to engage all major power. They want all major power to come to ASEAN as a fulcrum for cooperation, not confrontation. This is very important. You know, uh, there is a one uh, idea which I think maybe uh, Cambodia will pick it up. Thailand has proposed last year as a, a foreign minister meeting, the so-called ASEAN plus two forum, meaning uh, ASEAN will meet with representative from United States and China to discuss area of common cooperation. Instead of uh, having you know, two major powers face to face and listen to them in the middle of East Asia Summit or any other ASEAN regional forum. Uh, that is the idea. And I think Thailand want to make sure that major power when they met, 
as Dr. Surin said, you know, you have a stable ASEAN, you have one less problems to deal with in the world. And that is a very big problem, 665 million. So, so that's the trick. I don't know whether ASEAN will succeed or not, or whether Cambodia uh, will call on this, but the idea is there. You know, I think it's very good if China, Xi Jinping, because Xi Jinping uh, uh, value ASEAN-China relation and Biden also a value. So Biden actually proposed a special ASEAN meeting. Uh, the second one in Washington DC, great idea, but it was postponed because of the Ukraine and also uh, time conflicts, you know, I wish that they could meet. Uh, Trump proposed the idea in Las Vegas last year in the same month, but it was postponed because of the COVID. I'm afraid, you know, that uh, good idea, good plan were disrupt, you know, by many the so-called unexpected uh, events or unintended consequent, which I think the Russian Ukraine will render, will impact on our region in an unpredictable manner, Professor. Hmm. Back in January, you wrote a piece touching on Japan's Asia policy, and you cite Japan's new economic doctrine that emphasizes ASEAN and a separate area focusing on China, South Korea, and India. You explain that Japan's engagement with ASEAN will be different going forward in that it will seek to improve Southeast Asia's capabilities with global supply chain management, innovation, and addressing social challenges. Uh, Kovi, what more can you share with us about this new chapter in Japan's Asia policy and how has the region responded? Well, uh, Professor, you are very good at pointing uh, potholes or what I did not say. What I did not say is that Japan actually want to improve strategic relation with ASEAN, but it cannot say so. That's why Japan came out with the whole new approach that will treat ASEAN as an equal partner, as partnership of innovation in promoting economic integration and development. And this is part of what America want uh, Japan integration with ASEAN economy, the so-called Indo-Pacific economic framework, which have not yet come out. Japan uh, is the most important partner uh, uh, of China, uh, of, of, uh, of United States in this region. And I think uh, Japan is uh, uh, doing more on strategic matter. For example, Japan is the member of the Quad. And I will uh, uh, give my further view that Japan will become a strategic dialogue partner next year when ASEAN and Japan will uh, commemorate 50th anniversary of their relation. Already you have two countries that uh, were given status, very important comprehensive strategic partnership. Only two countries, China and Australia. Now United States have a pride. And I think uh, if there is a second special ASEAN uh, US summit, that's comprehensive strategic uh, partnership status will be announced for the United States. So next year, you will have uh, Japan as a quad member who are strategic. So there will be additional area with, which Japan can do. At the moment, Japan is very careful given its uh, uh, World War II history. Japan has been uh, the leader in helping providing economic incentive uh, investment that has uh, propelled uh, economic developments uh, uh, for Southeast Asia. And you have to give credit to Japan because they are the one that united former Indochina and also mainland Southeast Asia. You know, ASEAN used to be three different world altogether. You have Myanmar doing its own way. You have Indochina doing its own way and Southeast Asia. And then Japan has helped, you know, hey, listen guys, you know, follow the geese. You know, so now there is different ball game. So I think, ASEAN has to manage uh, Japan differently. And Japan also has to be very careful because ASEAN love to see country that engage with them has independent policy and is not part of other uh, big scheme. So there's certain cooperation amongst friends and alliance. Of course, this is important. Like uh, uh, 
uh, uh, President uh, uh, Joe Biden uh, has stressed that he wanted to stress uh, friends and airline cooperation. Some months back, you wrote a piece entitled ASEAN can live with the Quad and AUKUS. Uh, can you share with us a bit more about how Southeast Asia views the Quad and AUKUS? Well, at the moment, I think uh, there is no consensus towards general view. They were not happy because the, uh, nobody consulted them. ASEAN love to have consultation with uh, major power. Otherwise, uh, we don't know how to prepare. So it came as a surprise uh, for us. And that is why you have certain member of the Quad and August, you know, namely uh, Japan as a member of the Quad trying to uh, minimize, uh, try to uh, come out with some positive remarks saying that Quad is for uh, uh, non-security matter. Look at us, Japan, we give you guarantee. That is why Japan is the only country that have a joint a declaration cooperation with ASEAN Indo-Pacific outlook, which is ASEAN Indo-Pacific uh, framework, just like United States and seven other countries. We have too many Indo-Pacific uh, framework, uh, emphasis uh, different uh, area of uh, cooperation. For August, I think uh, uh, certain country express very strong views. And I think uh, this view creates uh, uh, much more deeper discussion this year when the United States came uh, to the region. Because I think it's still unfinished, it's the talk in progress on this issue. You've written so thoughtfully on all these issues for a number of years now. Um, if Joe Biden were to come to you and ask for advice on how the US should handle relations with Thailand and with, and with Southeast Asia more broadly, what pieces of advice would you give him? Oh, I have many, many, but the first thing is the most important. Number one, you know, actions speak louder than talks. If you want to compare with Japan and China, they talk and then they, they immediately deliver. America, when America promised something, it take a long time because of the Americans procedure, the way the legislative process, I understand that because Americans, uh, have a very specific role, certain uh, uh, regulation you have follow. Uh, so that you cannot deliver quick, but amazingly with Ukraine, you have done that in no time at all. With Southeast Asia, because Southeast Asia is not top priority, but now it's very important in the post Russia Ukraine conflict. Professor Kover, I would be the first one to say that Southeast Asia will be the battlefield of major power rivalry, especially Mekong region, mainland Southeast Asia. Of course, maritime is still important, South China Sea, but mainland Southeast Asia, we have Myanmar and all that. So I would say action, action. Number two, five years, America ignore ASEAN, no ambassador to ASEAN for almost five years now, almost entered the sixth year. Terrible. And you keep saying ASEAN is important. It's not true. It's only wording. Because every time United States said, oh, we give you very important, you look at us, you know, we send you uh, uh, important people, wise foreign minister, go to Singapore, uh, to Vietnam, blah, 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 blah. But in Southeast Asia, leaders are important. Leader present is important. It's important. You know, Trump failed all of this uh, uh, requirement. China never failed in attending ASEAN summit. This is why they develop a very good rapport. Biden also uh, need to do that. He has done well because the first time last year uh, under Brunei chairmanship, uh, he attend, uh, that is why he proposed invite everybody or the leader to, uh, uh, Washington, uh, D.C., but I must tell you, I have a historical anecdote. You know, the difference between this current administration and the previous one, particularly his former boss, 
uh, Obama administration. Obama in 2016, Professor Gover can fix the so-called Sunnyland Special ASEAN US summit in Sunnyland, California, less than three months because of personal invitation in Kuala Lumpur. You know, you have a uh, president tapping on the shoulder of the ASEAN leader. Hey guys, I'm leaving, you know, hey, let's have a meeting. Everybody said, yes, that is why. Normally when you fix a summit meeting, it takes years in advance. Look at the schedule this year. My goodness, ASEAN have three important meeting. ASEAN related meeting in early, uh, first week of uh, November, and we will immediately follow by MG20 in Jakarta on the 13-14. And then you have big one, APEC in Bangkok. So Biden has to make sure that he can come. He can give all kinds of excuse. And to be fair, you know what happened in America? Midterm election, oh my goodness. What gonna happen? So all these things feature in, there's so many unpredictable uh, the, uh, development for us. It's a nightmare every year. We want to engage America. We realize America is important and America want to engage us, but something always come in between. I don't know why, Professor. Well, those are important points you make, to be sure. Uh, a question on Myanmar. Um, this week, you authored a column on the need for ASEAN to work towards preventing a proxy war in Myanmar. And you wrote that the war uh, between Russia and Ukraine shows that, As that if ASEAN is unable to work closely together on solutions to its own problems, other powers may take the liberty of inviting themselves into the fray. And you, are, you argue that ASEAN must be prepared to respond to fast changing, strategic and uh, disruptive environments. Specifically, what measures are you recommending ASEAN take? Now, I think ASEAN uh, has to put a lot more pressures on the uh, military junta in Nepidor. And I think ASEAN has done, but uh, it's not yet enough, but after this uh, first visit, which will end today, I think there will be further development. Uh, I would describe as uh, uh, some tangible development, but it's not yet sufficient. We have to wait more. You know why, Professor? Because at the moment, conflicting parties still have the illusion that they can win this war by themselves. Meaning the uh, Tatmadaw, which is the ruling uh, military force, against the resistance which com comprised uh, three different factions. You have the national unity government, uh, which stationed abroad, representative in America, Australia, India, and all the friendly countries, United States, also in Canada. So they have uh, set up the People Defense Force uh, September last year. So now they are fighting uh, guerrilla warfare, which has created a lot of damage to a civilian's uh, population. And as a response, Tatmadaw also fought back. So a lot of people die. Uh, and then you have the so-called, these very few people uh, talk about uh, militia, small personal militia. Yeah. You know, imagine some of the Latin America, we are familiar, but this is not drug cartels. It's just sometimes belong to certain village, belong to a certain community. They have to protect themselves because they cannot expect the government or other group. The last one, other group means the so-called um, ethnic organization. They have their own armies. They are uh, armed to the teeth, 18 groups of them. They're fighting war. Some of them are part of the peace agreement. Some of them are more aggressive than the other. Some of them are more willing to negotiate. So these are the thing, this is the resistance. Can you imagine if this drag on for one year, then you will have Western countries say, hey, listen, the resistance is probably winning. Let's give us support, no brutes on the ground, but we give you arms money, just like uh, NATO. NATO said no boots on the ground, but everything other than that, airplanes and everything, you know, missile. We don't want that to happen. So ASEAN must, must 
make sure that one of its family is bring back, but it must be justification, tangible uh, progress. This is a, a realistic, pragmatic uh, perspective. Uh, you will see that my, my view is completely different than the uh, narrative in uh, outside because they see that uh, uh, Myanmar is uh, evil, of course, very brutal and should be isolated forever. No, we're not. We have to bring, we have to make sure that we have to engage just like what happened in Russia, Ukraine now, further dialogue, you know, because it's unwinnable war, mysteries to civilian, refugee crossing the border. I'm talking about refugee crossing the border. Thailand is very concerned. As I wrote in my pieces that you mentioned, we have 200, uh, 2,401 kilometers undemarked, professor, and the so-called natural channel. Can you imagine? We have never created the wall like uh, Mexican US uh, around Texas or your border. We are waiting. If there's a crisis, just 10,000, 20,000 cross the border, high security apparatus, health security, COVID, finish. At the moment, Thailand is trying to vaccinate 5 million guest worker from Myanmar, not to mention Laos and Cambodia. Only, only less than maybe 7% 7, 7 that have been vaccinated. So it's still very uh, minimal. If they are not safe, we are not safe. That's the problem. And can you imagine? I also wrote that uh, there was some seized weapon. You know, uh, illegal uh, arm smuggling is easier than human smuggling, drug smuggling, because it's hot money, hot item. And I don't want to see that. But you will see that. You see video all the time, you know, uh, some training given to the arm ethnic group and students. Uh, young students freeing uh, the oppressive regime and put them on social media, particularly young uh, men and women. So this is the problem. If we allow this to drag on, I think everybody will join in. This is the war between aggressor and we have, as in the global narrative, you know, we have to fight against the uh, the dictator, the brutal regime of Myanmar. And that is the case ASEAN uh, will be pushed on the sideline and we have to take side. But at the moment, I think uh, this year and next year with Indonesia, these two crucial year, the remaining uh, 20, 18 months are very crucial for peace process, Professor. You kindly shared thoughts about ASEAN's relations with uh, China, as well as ASEAN's relations with the US. Thank you. Um, what can you tell us about uh, ASEAN's relations with India today? Oh, very good. Uh, you have to know that uh, India is the, uh, our so-called Coca-Cola and apple pies. You know, we have not taken tandoori every day, but uh, all the cultural aspiration and traditions, uh, of course, come from uh, India, particularly uh, South Asia. India uh, is very fortunate because India value uh, ASEAN relation. But given uh, the way India conduct their political uh, and foreign policy, it is, it is, I repeat, Professor, very slow very slow. You know, India has uh, uh, three phases of policy. You have a look ease, at ease, you know, which uh, the government has focused more on Southeast Asia. And now uh, the policy is moving away toward Quad because of uh, uh, growing rivalry with China. Now you are talking more about the uh, ARC, of democracy. So you have India uh, forming closer uh, relations, strategic relations with the uh, United States, Australia, and Japan. But as you can see from the wording of the UN Assembly resolution on aggression 
on Ukraine. India has its own limits, just like Laos and Vietnam, member of ASEAN, when it comes to the relation with uh, Russia or former Soviet Union. Thailand has that limit too, but our limit uh, is different. We have freer space. And uh, Cambodia also uh, has been very Machiavellian in co-sponsoring and support in favor of the uh, resolution that tell you the dynamic of ASEAN as the uh, group, you know, we are not, I must say again, we are not EU. People always say, why don't do like EU? No, uh, I can say that we borrow some good idea from EU, for example, the idea of having uh, every year summit meetings, that's the European idea, but European went further, you know, every six months. So we have two meetings, two summit each year. Now, because of the COVID, two summit has been converged into a uh, back to back, you know. So the 40th and 41st summit will be held back to back for the past year because of the COVID. But this year it will be face to face. So this is how uh, I, I answer your, your question. I hope it's covered. Very much so, yes. I know Thailand um, strikes to have good relations with, um, with everybody. Uh, what can you tell us about Thailand's relations with Saudi Arabia and uh, Iran? To oh, different very good. Countries? Yeah. Um, the normalization between Thailand and Saudi Arabia occurred on January 6th. And it was uh, Saudi Arabia who wants it. Because Thailand has no leverage at all. For 32 years, my goodness, we beg and beg, you know, hey, listen, we want a, a very good relationship with you, you are a very powerful country, you are allied of the United States, you are oil exporting country, and we welcome your tourists, you know. But we don't have leverage because of this uh, uh, incidence of uh, uh, jewelry robbery, but that is not the issue, actually. I think a lot of uh, mainstream media in Thailand use it uh, as the uh, main uh, reason, no. I think, um, uh, the normalization happened because of the changing, the chief in strategic relation within Middle East and that related to Southeast Asia. You know, Saudi Arabia under Crown Princess uh, bin Salman is very uh, active, very proactive, and he wants to engage Thailand. Mm -hmm. Professor Gover, you know what happened after January 6th? Within less than 14 days, Saudi Arabia open flight direct to Bangkok. Mm, okay. And now 11 company has been identified that you should send some food, goodies, you know, to Saudi Arabia. So it has been accumulated, you know, desire. Of course, that has to be placed against the background of growing strategic uh, competition not among the major power, but among the key player in the Middle East, which expand the sphere of influence in Southeast Asia. Why? Number one, Southeast Asia is the world's largest uh, Muslim country. You have Indonesia. In fact, I would argue that ASEAN is a bowl of salad because we have all the major religious uh, belief and faith living together. You talk about Christianity, look at the Philippines. You look at Muslim, the world largest, fourth largest, third largest democracy, fourth uh, uh, biggest country in the world. And then you have member of the Buddhist country in mainland, Thai, Lao, Cambodia, Myanmar. So they mix it together. There's multicultural, multi-religion language and all that. So as in that sense, diversity is very strong unity. But the mainstream media always said that we we are what you call disunited, which is not true. That tell you about our pragmatism. With Iran, Thailand has a very good relation with Iran. Why? Because Iran has been uh, developed relation with us for a long, long time ago, since the ancient time. In fact, uh, Iranian uh, diplomat uh, in the early Ayutthaya period, you know, uh, nearly 500 years ago, uh, came to the Thai loyal court and served as advisor, just like those from the Greek and Portuguese. So that kind of relation 
continue today. And also, uh, we do have uh, uh, a group of uh, Muslim followers. You have Sunni, of course, uh, which follow the uh, some of uh, Wahhabi, uh, the traditions of uh, mainstream. Uh, I, I mean, uh, you have uh, the Egypt, uh, the mainland, uh, Middle East, who have uh, the uh, Muslim uh, mainstream. And then you have also another uh, Shia, uh, which also Thailand have absorbed. You don't see them much, uh, they are small uh, minority. We have around maybe 10 million, uh, uh, I would say is informal of Muslim and less than, uh, less than maybe 0.5% are Shia. So that relation continue. So we maintain a very good balance. So at the moment, Professor, I will be the first to tell you, Thailand is one country Maybe there are several, but I have never seen. We have no enemy in the Middle East among 54 countries. So now Thailand is now in a very good strategic position for two reasons. Number one, uh, Thailand, it is the center of Indo-Pacific. You look at the map, just say rightly or wrongly, you know, that's the red part, red dot. So. Secondly, Thailand has a foreign policy that do not align with any, you know, we, we are very careful. So in the future, there maybe uh, could be some adjustment to make, but so far, so good. But this disruptive environment that uh, are coming to us, not only Thailand, because Thailand cannot change around, it need a regional environment to give support, particularly ASEAN, because Thailand is the only country that has DNA, ASEAN as a DNA because it has found ASEAN and it has never changed its policy since its inception. Dr. Serene will emphasize that, you know. Sure. Other it always changed. The Philippines, uh, Malaysia, Indonesia flip-flop at time, but Thailand very consistent, strengthen, 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 and now it's wholeness of ASEAN, also the role of Thailand. That is why a lot of people criticize Thailand. Say, why don't you speak out? No, I don't speak out. We speak out. That's the way uh, we have to approach uh, some of the country, some of the uh, situation. Professor Kova. You publish so frequently. Um, Kavi, what are your writing habits? Uh, where do you typically write? What time of the day or night do you write? And what's your method for turning out so much work? Uh, they're, 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 first of all, you ask a very uh, good question. First of all, uh, uh, the, I want to write because there are few people who write in Thailand, you can count. You know, uh, when Dr. Serene uh, was still alive, we joke, you know, you and me are two competitors because he's the newsmaker. I report on him, you know, so we are two. But in Thailand, we, we have uh, less, than, uh, less than five person who write on foreign policy and strictly who write regularly, maybe reduced to uh, three. And if you want to turn out frequently, reduced to two. I don't want to mention you know, who are that two, but I, I write it. Uh, I try to do two things. One <laughs> is to make sure that we have narrative from the region because uh, oftentimes uh, narrative from outside are much stronger, are much more peripheral, and they dominate the discussion and the discourse, and we lose. And if you Google, you don't see much, you know, about uh, Thailand foreign policy or ASEAN. You have a lot of uh, think tank in the state and in Europe writing about ASEAN and all that. I personally uh, want to write the side of ASEAN, how it stay together, how they make decision, even sometimes uh, seem useless, but it united uh, with lowest domination. But the point here is keep them together, act together and stick with it. So I want to continue uh, my narrative. And as I told you, nobody read it because uh, it's too long and it's fact-based, it's not opinion-based. We have writer um, mainly in Thai that uh, use uh, Ting Tang uh, as a background. They comment on Ting Tang, but never, 
using the indigenous uh, regional development. So number two, uh, I write uh, whenever the idea came in and when I see new development, like proxy war, you know, I, 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 I sense it that now NATO is meeting on Thursday. They will come up with a very strong commitment to give security and military power, push money to Ukraine. And I saw that if that is happening, you know, America keep emphasizing no boot on the ground, but how about supporting other boots on the ground? So the idea pops up, Myanmar is a weak point and ASEAN need to move. And that is why I, I see myself uh, as a sort of a early warning, you know? So as you always, uh, I'm, I'm very grateful to you. Uh, you make me nervous because you point out every article I wrote, you know, as is like you are auditing, you know, hey, you know, uh, something like that, but it's good, I'm, I'm glad. But uh, that's what I do. And, and I think it's very important. ASEAN is very important. Uh, to the region Southeast Asia, just as United Nations, to the peace and stability to the world, even though a lot of people uh, condemn them every day, you know, uh, as useless. What can I say? ASEAN is very important. I'd like to ask you about COVID. Um, what is the state of the COVID pandemic in Thailand now? And what about Myanmar? Oh, Myanmar situation is not good. That is why, uh, uh, there are some uh, special delivery by neighboring country and by NGO because United States is completely uh, anti the Tatmadaw. And, you know, America contributes a lot of vaccine to the uh, WHO administrator program, COVAX. And some of the people, some of the uh, uh, country, for example, uh, Sudan or Afghanistan benefit from COVID, but not including Myanmar. So Myanmar need vaccine. And Thailand, uh, for the first time last week, after all this controversial debate, you know, why don't you uh, give to the Thai first now? Uh, nearly 80% Thai have received two shots and 70% third booster. So now they're handing out. Uh, actually, now Thailand is follow major power with vaccine diplomacy, but in a much smaller scale. We have mm -hmm. given uh, half a million uh, Esther Seneca. Thailand is one of the 25th country that have license to produce, and the only one in Southeast Asia to produce Esther Seneca. So we are giving to Myanmar, next Vietnam and Laos. Cambodia doesn't need it because Cambodia uh, earlier uh, last year when, when you have the uh, COVID strike, Cambodia just taking everybody, the Russian, the Chinese, the Americans, so they very well cover. Mm. So that's the situation in Thailand. Luckily, I, I think uh, uh, the early engagement because of domestic politics is politicized. Uh, actually, Thai health program, healthcare program is very well designed because of the professionalism of the medical doctor. Thailand, as you know, for 30 years has a so-called uh, public health volunteer. Uh, also more in Thai, you know, Asa Samak. They are very good, you know. I, I live in the provinces. Uh, uh, each uh, volunteer take care of 10 members of the family. So they know who and who, who get COVID or no COVID, take injection or also they go out and they receive, you know, uh, less than 600 baht. Mm. It's about less than $19. But now the government give, uh, give them $28. So they are very happy, 1,000 baht. So they go out, and so they know everybody, so they can seek control. But at the moment, we still have a very high level because of Omicron, Delta Con. Uh, our last, yesterday is about 20,000 new infection, but we have declared that it will become uh, epidemic. So we will handle it. And one thing, you know, that is strange about Thailand, you go out, if you don't wear masks, they don't have to chow at you. They look at you and point finger. Oh, I'm sorry, I forget my mask, you know. So that's the collective uh, uh, spirit that, that we have. And you find that in other countries as well, in Southeast Asia. So that is not a problem, but it has been interpreted because the government, uh, because uh, 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 the public here, they, they, 
their obedience to dictator. No, I, I don't think so. They, they think that they, they have to contribute, you know, but now things, uh, I think from April 1st, um, most countries in the region will be open because they need tourism, they need to do business. For the past two years, you know, restaurants were closed, service industry have been disrupted. So that's is the general uh, uh, situation, but still certain country need vaccine, Myanmar, Myanmar. So we have to find a way to have a ceasefire in Myanmar, maybe temporarily open humanitarian corridor, just like Ukraine and Russia. And I think it's very important. So understanding of major power, please don't interfere. Follow ASEAN, ASEAN know best. ASEAN is slow, sometimes it quarrel, but in the end, family is a family, so they stick together. I just wanna ask you a few last quick questions. I wanna be mindful of your time, just in the remaining few minutes we have. Um, so if I understand you correctly, Thailand is now open to overseas tourists? Yes, uh, from April 1st, you don't have to take uh, the test and many other uh, requirements. So it's free to come, but you have to have uh, certain tests at the airport and to follow up on the fifth day, which is uh, uh, very few in comparison with the very strict regimen, you know, regulation in the past. So that means hopefully soon, Americans and others will be visiting Thailand again. Um, oh yeah, I think America, yes, yes. That's just wonderful news. And, you know, I know a lot has changed over the past two years. Um, do you have any restaurants in Bangkok that you can recommend for us to visit when we come to town? Oh my goodness, uh, Thailand uh, has over 500,000 restaurants. And uh, now a lot of them, uh, it now uh, feature in, uh, Michelin, and also uh, Yap, and many other uh, uh, leading uh, food magazine and rank ranking. I cannot give give you uh, uh, the name, but I would say that if you come, I promise to take you to visit some of the street food restaurant, which is everywhere. Thai street food now has become world famous because people enjoyed it. You know good food, fresh, you know, and uh, Michelin uh, star have been given to Thai street food because they are wonderful. You can never imagine uh, award Michelin star to French restaurant street food, you know, there's no such thing. But right. in Thailand, it's become the uh, prominent. You come to Thailand, you go to Michelin uh, uh, star street food, you know, like for example, crab, uh, omelette, wonderful, you know, pricey. And then you have noodles, you know, uh, uh, with uh, beef, uh, broth and all that. Very interesting. Yeah, that was what I was gonna ask you. Do you have a particular dish that you recommend visitors try? Oh, uh, Thai have five dishes that people try, which I don't think you, you uh, must have, for example, tom yam, pad thai, pad siu, gang, gang kheo wan, and mu sate. So that is five. You probably know it's a uh, 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 sate, thai sate, pad thai, green curry, and also uh, fried flat, fry flat noodles. Uh, so these are the things. But now, you know what happened? Because of the influence from modern gourmet and also the standardization, of food safety and the awareness of uh, green. So you have now private chef that come up with the private kitchen, you know. I, I would like to propose to you, if you want to eat a, a, a good combination of Thai cuisine, go to the restaurant named Sam Law, okay. which is the Thai city, Sam Law. And you have to book in advance one month or two months and they serve limited guests. And it's not cheap, it's cost about I think uh, eighty nine dollars during uh, this current uh, current. Uh, they serve you uh, maybe uh, nearly uh, twelve courses of food. They they mix all the in ingredient natural ingredient from certain provinces. A very European in preparation, 
very uh, high level standard, very clean and very uh, hygienic. So now you see this high premium level, you know, uh, Thai gourmet, which accessible by those who have uh, uh, money, you know, but street Thai food, you can get the same taste, excitement of street food, but uh, it's still uh, the same old Tom Yam, you know, and all that. But there's a new trend here. Very uh, gourmet, very uh, stylish, very good, but very expensive. Well, it sounds wonderful. And thank you for that, uh, that tip. Um, Kovi, I'm grateful for you taking the time to do this. I know how very busy you are and I've learned so much. And on top of that, it's been very enjoyable. So thank you very much. Thank you. Sawadee Thank you so much. Sawadee Kap.